Hello, in this video we're talking about background compression in photography. I will show you how you can get images like this with a moon appearing to be huge behind a building or some other foreground object 100% in camera without any photoshopping whatsoever. And if you kind of already know what you need to do then in this video I will also explain what is the underlying principle that makes this effect possible, what is actually happening here and what is the science behind all that. And also I will get into the fact why it's not the focal length of a lens that is producing this effect but it's actually something else. Ok so without any further ado let's get started. Ok, so at first to help us better understand what is actually going on here, let's take a look at this diagram. Right here we have a square right in the middle and this is our foreground object. Then on this side we have a circle that depicts for instance the moon and then in order to photograph the foreground and the background in the same kind of line of sight then we need to be with our camera on the opposite side of the background in order to photograph it like this. And then let's say that this is the cone of our angle of view and as you can see the foreground takes this much space in our cone right here at this distance from the camera and this pretty much depicts what will be the apparent size of the foreground in our frame. The apparent size of this foreground object is pretty much how much space does it take with regards to how much do we actually see at this distance from our camera. The ratio between them depicts how big an object will be. If the ratio is larger then the object will appear to be larger and if this ratio is smaller then the object will appear to be smaller. Ok, so let's take a look what happens if we use a longer focal length. The longer focal length is pretty much just producing a narrower cone of our angle of view. So if we have a narrower angle of view, what happens here? Well, we kind of enlarge the foreground object and depending on what focal length that we actually use, maybe we are not even fitting the entirety of the foreground object into our frame. So if we want our foreground object to appear the same size in our frame as previously then what we need to do? Well we need to back up with our camera. We need to take a few steps back in order to create this effect where the lines of these two cones will pretty much converge exactly at the distance that the foreground object is from us and that will create the effect that the foreground object has the exact same apparent size in our frame. Ok, so let's look what happens at the plane where the background object lies. Where if we draw this perpendicular line right here you can see that the size of this background object didn't change but what did change is the length of these two sections and as I said before the apparent size of an object in a frame is the ratio between those two numbers. So the ratio in the second case is going to be larger because we are going to be dividing the same size of a background object by a lower integer and that will make the effect that the background object appears to be larger in our frame. But wait, what did we just do? I just proved that it actually is the focal length that is creating this effect, this background compression, that background appears to be larger. But in the intro I said it's not the focal length. So what is actually happening here? Ok, so let's take a look at another example. Right here we have a map and this is a place where I went out to shoot a hyperlapse a while back. I was walking along this path, along this edge of this meadow and I was photographing right here in the distance there is this church, it's a very famous church actually in Krakow, the Mariatsky church. If you ever visited Krakow this was probably on the top of your list of places to visit. And right here somewhere around this place in this meadow we have this monument stone, we have this, we have this large stone that is clearly visible. The point is that I was walking along this line so I have two images. One image is taken from this position which was my starting position and the second image that I'm about to show you is about from this position right here. And take a look at those two frames. Well obviously on the frame on the left we are further back from the stone and on the image on the right we are close to the stone. But if we crop in the first image to make the stone appear to be the same size, take a look what happens. On the image on the left the church that is in the distance actually appears to be way larger than on the image on the right which was taken by us standing closer by to the stone. So what is happening here because I was shooting this hyperlapse on a 24mm focal length lens. I didn't change the lens, I was just walking with the exact same lens and on the image that was taken at the beginning of the hyperlapse when I cropped in the church in the distance appeared to be larger. In this example the background object is the church and the foreground object is the stone. So what did it change here? Hmm, if we didn't change the focal length what did we change? We changed the distance. 
And this is actually the key to this entire effect of background compression, the distance from the foreground. Because at the beginning of the hyperlapse, the first image that I have taken, I was further back from the foreground. And then as I was walking closer, I was getting closer and closer. And the second image that I have shown you was taken much closer to this stone. And that made the effect that the church appeared to be way, way, way smaller with regards to the size of this stone. So the key thing here is the distance from the foreground object and not really the focal length of the lens. Because it doesn't even happen only in cameras and with the use of lenses, it also happens in our eyes. Think of it this way, imagine that you are in Paris and you are right at the foot of the Eiffel Tower and you are watching a moonrise happening right behind the Eiffel Tower. Well, the Eiffel Tower is huge from the place that you are standing on, but the moon has, you know, the size of the moon. So the moon, with regards to the Eiffel Tower, is really Really, really minuscule and the Eiffel Tower is like huge from the place that you are standing. But if you are further back, if you are somewhere on the outskirts of Paris or maybe even in Montmartre or something like this, then if you are watching the same exact action, let's say that the azimuths converge and everything and you are seeing the moonrise happening right behind the Eiffel Tower, well, then the size of the moon is pretty much the same as it was when we are standing at the foot of the Eiffel Tower, but the Eiffel Tower is way, way smaller. So the relationship between the sizes of the Eiffel Tower and the Moon in the second example is actually way closer to each other. And if you just take a fraction of the field of view at this position in Montmartre, the Moon appears to be bigger than in the first situation. So again, we are not even using a camera or anything like this, just your eye and obviously you didn't change the focal length of the lens in your eye, you just went further back and you are just sort of cropping into your field of view and the apparent size of the moon with regards to the size of the Alpha Tower well, seems to change. So why is it that if we are getting further away from our foreground object, obviously the foreground object appears to be smaller, but why does the background object not appear to be smaller as well? Well, it all boils down to the math, because how exactly is the size of what we see related to the distance and the angles and everything? Well, imagine that the size of what you actually see is the difference is the size of an angle that is produced by the cone from the one edge of an object to the other edge of an object. If you need to look at an object and the cone from both ends of this object is larger, the angle is larger here, then the object will appear to your eye or to the camera lens or whatever to be larger. If this cone is smaller, if this angle here is way narrower, then this object will appear to be smaller. And we can actually plot it out. We can actually plot out how this angle, this angle changes with regards to the distance if the size of an object is the same. And take a look at this plot. This is actually plotted using a awesome website called wolframalpha.com. I will leave some links in the description down below to this website. You can check it out. And I'm not going to dive into why exactly this kind of formula depicts this relationship, but from what you can see in this chart is that if you're close by to this object, then the angle changes more rapidly as you're getting further away. And if you already are further away and you back off the same kind of distance, then the change in this angle is going to be smaller. So if you're standing right beside an object, it takes like 180 degrees on both sides. If you back off by one meter, the change in this angle is going to be way, way more significant than if you're already like one kilometer behind this object and you back off one meter, then the object is not going to get that significantly smaller to your eye because this angle is going to be going at this kind of rate. It actually asymptotically approaches zero and it never mathematically will actually approach zero. The further back you are from an object, this angle is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and the rate of drop of this angle is also going to be smaller and smaller and smaller and it will reach zero at infinity mathematically, which means it will never approach zero. But the point is that if you are already far away from a background object and you back off the same distance, then the change in size of this background object that is further away from the foreground object will change less rapidly than the apparent size of the foreground object. I hope it makes sense. If it doesn't, definitely hit me up in the comments down below. I would love to elaborate more on that. So in our situation with the moon, that is already pretty, pretty damn far away from Earth, then if you are backing off by like one or two kilometers from our foreground object, the foreground object will get significantly smaller, but the moon will not. So if you take an image of this and then just take a fraction with only around the foreground object, then the moon will appear to be huge behind this foreground object, which is exactly what we were after. 
So why do we actually use as photographers long focal lens in order to produce such images? Well, take a look at this example. And right here we are back at this meadow in Krakow and I was standing in this exact same spot at the beginning of this meadow. And we have a shot taken with the 24 mm focal length. And then a few days afterwards, I came back there and I take a shot with a 300 mm focal length. And take a look at these images. I have cropped in the 24 mm version of this image in order to make sure that the stone, which is our foreground object, appears to be the exact same size. And as you can see, both the stone and the church are pretty much the same size. The same kind of compression happened in those two scenarios. But the image on the left, look at it. It's ugly. It's pretty much, you know, it's horrible. The resolution of this image is terrible. And it is because I have to heavily, heavily, heavily crop into this image in order to make it appear to be the same size as a full-size image taken with 300 mm focal length. So we use long lenses in order to retain the full resolution of our sensor because what long lenses actually do is that they narrow down our angle of view before the light hits the sensor and that way only this fraction of the field of view is projected to the full resolution of our camera and that way we retain the resolution. Whereas if you use a wide angle and then crop in, we are getting the projection of a wider cone onto the same size of the sensor, the same amount of pixels. And then in order to crop in, we basically need to discard all of the pixels around the small rectangle in the middle that we are actually interested in. So that way we are losing a lot, a lot of resolution and to not lose resolution, we use long focal lens in order to produce these images. And like I said in the beginning, if you want to photograph the moon behind an object, well, you need to align yourself in a way that they form a straight line. So you need to know in advance where the moon will be at a given time, at a given location. And in order to know that, I can highly recommend a video I have previously done about Planet, an app for iOS and Android that is phenomenal when it comes to planning where stuff will be on the sky. You can plan shots with the moon, with the sun, with the Milky Way, with stars, with constellations, comets, whatever. Definitely check out Planet. Link to this video is right here. And also I'll put some links in the description to more videos I have already done on my channel that are related to this subject. So that's basically all I have for you for this video. If you like this, definitely leave a like down below. I would really appreciate it. Also, like I mentioned, leave a comment if any of part of this video was confusing. I would love to elaborate more on that and explain anything that might be confusing to you. And also consider subscribing to my channel because I post a lot of videos related to photography, filmmaking, basically everything that revolves around stuff that you can do with your camera. And I post new videos pretty much every single week. So definitely subscribe to don't miss out on future videos. And right now check out these two videos. They are definitely be interesting to you on this subject. And see you next time, hopefully, and bye-bye.